So there's a lot of things. Oh, I'm getting recorded. Um, whoops, whoops, we got started over again. Pardon me. What happened there? Oh, there we go. Uh, sorry about that. So, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm so Sarah. Sorry, <laughs> <Yeah>. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just writing Anyways. a note in the chat that this meeting will be recorded. I apologize that that actually did not go over as smoothly as I had intended it. Thank you, that's Sarah. That's okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so adult butterflies. So some of the ones that you see first thing in the spring, like the morning cloak butterflies, they're actually spending their winter underneath in the leaf litter and in the uh, debris that's left over from all of the, the spring and summer of the previous year. So when you rake up those leaves, you risk taking those adults out of there along with fritillary butterflies or adults. Um, and there's lots of, yeah, lots of beetles, lots of ladybugs. Bees are usually in the ground, but sometimes they might be. Um, oh, did I get paused there? Oh, am I not sharing anymore? Uh, are we? Sorry about that. Seems we're. Are we okay? Can you see everything, Kathleen? I can. Are you having? Okay. It just said my screen sharing is paused, but maybe I'm okay now. Maybe we're good. Okay. Let me know if there's any issues. Okay. <laughs> So um, as I was saying, so some of those leaves uh, may already have butterfly or moth eggs on them as well. So not only is it the adults that we're worried about in the caterpillars, but there may be eggs of insects, including moths, butterflies, aphids, um, which I know a lot of people don't like, but they're very important for your garden biodiversity. Um, so leaving those leaves, if you can, is gonna help you next year for your garden and all of the insects that are gonna keep the garden going for the birds, um, for the butterflies, everything that you need that you would like to attract to your garden. And, and also, oh. I do have bad news. Uh-oh. It does appear that your screen share is, because we're still on your original Stopped. slide. Do you wanna give it a yep. try again there? Yeah, so it should still be on this slide. We're You're we're on your okay. leaves, perfect, thank you. I'll let you know, I'll let you know when I switch it and you can tell me if it doesn't work. Okay, thank yeah. you. How about that? Uh, so leaves are an important part of nutrient cycling. So not only are they gonna protect the biodiversity in your yard, but they're acting as free fertilizer for you. So next spring, you don't have to worry about fertilizing your garden or your lawn if you leave the leaves because they will naturally decompose. And the benefit of this is that because they decompose slowly, they're providing throughout the summer or summer, winter, um, they're providing that nutri nutrition throughout the winter rather than that big blast of fertilizer that we often give in the spring and summer. So it's a slow release fertilizer that's actually gonna provide them nutrients that will last longer and give them what they need to hopefully get through the winter. And it also helps retain moisture in the soil by preventing evaporation. So a few benefits of leaving the leaves there outside of biodiversity as well. Oh no, now I can't move my screen. There we go. Uh, can you see the, the change there, Kathleen? I just switched it. Yes, I sure can. Okay, Thank you. All right, um, so then next comes plants. So you can cut down your plants. Again, that's something that a lot of people do to give themselves that clean slate first thing in the spring. And maybe you don't like the aesthetics of leaving plants. I completely get that. Um, if you can see my, my pointer here, this milkweed here, uh, let's be honest, it's a little bit ugly. So cutting down some of these plants makes total sense if you are going for an aesthetically pleasing yard. And I cut down my milkweed, but I don't cut it down all the way. Um, so I do leave about six inches of stem for bees that overwinter in there. And also I often find sunflower seeds wedged in there by chickadees. So I like to leave as much as I can for hiding spots and for overwintering habitat. And when I do cut down those stems, I leave them on the ground because again, that's gonna provide that uh, cover, compost and overwintering habitat for, for animals. So some other ideas for your garden in the fall is to start thinking about next year. Inevitably, I get to midsummer and I start thinking like, what's missing from my garden this year that I could bring in for next year? And fall is an excellent time to start adding things, whether it's um, accessories like wood that you can see up here in the corner, you can add dead wood, which provides a lot of benefits for insects that can burrow inside of there and lay their eggs. Um, bees, a lot of bees do lay inside dead wood as well. Um, whether it's something like that, or maybe you're thinking about um, adding more plants. 
And any time before the ground is frozen, you can still put those plants in the ground. They'll still be able to establish their roots and they will still come back next year. So it's a great time to plant plugs. And because you're not dealing with the summer heat that will be coming if you do them in the spring, they actually often do better because they're not as heat stressed and they have that opportunity to have that slow release of your compost and also of the water that's retained within that compost if you keep it there. Also, you can think about seeds. So sun seeds actually need a cold period called stratification before they'll actually germinate, like milkweed um, per se. And so if you want to plant seeds, check them now to see if they do need that stratification and get them in the ground so that they get that cold period. Otherwise, you won't get them germinating until at least the next year. And if you're anything like me, by next year, I've planted over that area because I don't like blank spots in my yard, as somebody once told me. Um, also, keep watering the garden. It may look like everything's done for the season. It doesn't really look like that in mine yet. There's still a lot that's green, but even if it was all looking dead and done, it's not. Underneath the ground, it's still going until that ground is frozen. Plants are still using water and they still need that to survive. Um, you'll often hear in Calgary, in the middle of winter, if we don't have snow cover and we get a Chinook, Sometimes you'll hear on the news them telling you to water your trees. It's incredibly important because that's what helps them get through the stress of the cold winter and any other adverse weather that we might find is having that water in the soil to feed the, to feed the trees and also soak up nutrients from the soil. And with no leaves on the trees, it's ever, even more important to have that in the, the soil, get those soil nutrients. So if you are looking at putting plants in that maybe you've looked at your yard this year and said, there's nothing blooming in September, there's nothing blooming in October. If there's nothing blooming in October, well, that's just how it goes, but you might get some things blooming in October. Uh, things like fireweed can bloom through until October. Asters are excellent late season bloomers for pollinators. Goldenrod is another one that will bloom um, August, September, October. Joe pieweed is a really great one, not just for um, bees and butterflies, but also hummingbirds, as is fireweed. Sunflowers, so you can plant annual sunflowers every year. There are native annual sunflowers, or you can get the non-native sunflowers, and they're going to grow and flower at the end of the season. And they're super important, not just for bees, like bees are all over them, but you'll also get um, hummingbirds, and uh, the seeds are excellent food for birds. So I did see in this last one, maybe I didn't, didn't really point it out. Oh, no, it's not that one, this one. Um, so what I have here is the milkweed, which looks terrible once it's done. So you can cut that down. But the sunflowers, you can see this one's actually already been picked clean by the birds. They've picked it clean. And um, so I leave all of my sunflower heads uh, standing until they're empty. And even then, sometimes I'll leave them because sometimes things like spiders like to hide in there and overwinter. Um, the goldenrod seeds down at the bottom here, they're excellent food source for birds and also a good hiding place for some little insects inside of that fluff. And this hollyhock, um, the plant itself may kind of tip over, but these seed pods are such great hiding spots for spiders. I find spiders in them every time. So if you can leave them, you're providing that sustenance for birds over winter. So I would leave them if you can. Um, so sorry, that was that was a back on my, my sunflowers there. And also harebells. I still have, um, also known as bluebells, I still have them blooming in my yard. Even though there's been frost, they're still going. So the beauty of native plants is they can withstand a bit of frost and what we normally think of as a killing frost does not kill our native plants and some of them will keep going until they can go no more and harebells is one of them. So if you have the, the space to add some more plants, these are all good choices. Um, fireweed does come with the caveat, I always have to warn people, it's my favorite plant in the world but it spreads prolifically both by seeds and by its roots. So if you do not want that in your yard, don't put fireweed. The rest of them are, are good. You won't have that issue with them. Goldenrod can be, can spread by its roots, but I've never had an issue with it spreading aggressively. So a note about holiday decorations. Another thing to consider when you are thinking about fall and winter in your yard, uh, they're super fun. I love decorations, especially at Christmas time. I love outdoor Christmas lights and I have been guilty of putting Christmas lights in our trees and 
I never really thought too much about it until it, it came to my attention that lights like Christmas lights actually can be disorienting for birds. However, there is good news with uh, Christmas lights. If you can get in the red spectrum, seems to be a better option for, um, for wildlife rather than white. White seems to cause a lot more confusion with bats and with birds. And I know what you're thinking, bats in the middle of winter, if it's warm enough, they may be active. Um, unlikely, but they might if it warms up enough. But anything in the red, the pink that you can see at the bottom, the green and the blue is okay too. You can also use the dimmer LED lights, which are a little bit uh, less bright and confusing for an animal that's flying around and depends on light for, uh, for their navigation. So you can see just in this picture here, we've got um, the very bad is lights that blast out all over the place. The bad is the ones that are still kind of pointing uh, around the whole periphery, but kind of missing the sky a little bit. Better are lights that are pointing kind of neutral and the best are lights that are gonna point down. So if you have lights on your house, if you can get the kind that point downwards rather than projecting out across the entire neighborhood, that's gonna be your best bet to prevent window strikes from uh, birds and, and bats as well. And we can also see at the top here, this is an owl stuck in some Halloween decorations. So the fake cobwebs that people put in their trees a lot, of, a lot or in their shrubbery looks fun, looks cool, but is really hazardous, not just for birds, but also for things like spiders and other insects. If there's still bees around, they might fly into that, get stuck, and they're not getting out. Um, this bird luckily would be rescued as this is from the photo is from wild care which which involves wildlife rehabilitation so there. This bird got lucky but not every bird does and you may just create a sitting duck for another animal to come along and, and peg off so something to consider, um, maybe not so much the cobwebs and dimmer lights, you don't have to go no lights, you can you can still have lights just wildlife friendly lights. So the impact of your fall garden decisions is going to change what your garden looks like in the spring. Um, so less habitat in the fall for insects can mean less habitat and food for other wildlife in the spring and also during the winter. So let's take a closer look at some animals that we might find in our neighborhoods during the winter here in Calgary and Alberta and see how these decisions uh, to leave your leaves, to cut your plants down, to water your trees, all of that good stuff, how that's gonna affect wildlife in our areas. And maybe I'll just pause for a second. Um, Kathleen, I don't know if there's any questions from anybody, but please do feel free to ask questions anytime. I'm happy to happy to stop and answer anything. I don't see any uh, questions on the side. One thing that I wonder, you mentioned about plugs um, mm -hmm. and you taught me about plugs. Do you mind explaining to folks who, who maybe, maybe don't know what the difference between a plug and another type of plant you might buy, what that's like? Sure. So if you're going to a regular nursery, you're going to buy pots. So you'll get like a four inch pot or a six inch pot or a liter or a gallon pot, that sort of thing. Often when you buy native plants, um, which you by no means have to, if you're if you're adding things, you can add non native asters, all of that good stuff. As I said, the non native sunflowers. Um, but if you are getting from a native nursery, what you're going to get is a plug. And so that's basically just a ready to go plant that's been grown in a small container and is easy kind of like trees when you look at like tree planters, they carry tree plugs with them. So that's essentially what you're doing. So you can just literally plug it in the ground and uh, and it's just a small plant that's that's ready to go. Awesome. Thank you for explaining that. Is it a bit more of an affordable way to go too, to get more for your dollar if you're wanting to spread, you know, get, get more native plants into your garden? Um, so yeah. like plants, I would buy Plugs over seeds, um, I would choose, it depends what kind of area you're trying to cover. So sometimes people mix the two, so they'll do plants and seeds. It all depends on germination of your seeds. So for some plants like milkweed, I had no luck growing them from seeds myself. So I went with the plugs and that turns out to be a more economical option for me because you put one or two in, they spread over time and that's gonna take over that area and fill it in. Um, the beauty of native plants in the long term is because they are adapted to our conditions, 
it's probably going to be more economical for you in the long run because they will last for longer. So they don't need as much maintenance. So it'll save you on water costs, on fertilizer costs, on all of the, the costs that come with um, a traditional cultivated garden. And also because they're used to our weather conditions, including Chinooks, they're more likely to make it through that winter. A lot right. of uh, cultivated plants don't make it through the winter simply because they don't know what's happening when it warms up like that they'll start sending out their roots to start growing for the spring but it's not spring yet and then a cold snap hits and it's it's a shock to them and they can't they can't make it so of course that's not for everything but over the long term a native garden is going to save you money that makes sense okay thank you for explaining and no i don't see any other questions but uh feel free everyone if you do have some thanks i'll let you carry on sure kathleen will interrupt me if there is anything um, so <laughs> ladybugs, so let's start with ladybugs. It's like the, the favorite of everybody when we talk about garden insects, everybody always wants to talk about ladybugs. Um, so Alberta is home to 18 different ladybug species. Not all of them are native, but many of them are. Um, like this little bottom red guy is the seven spotted ladybug. He is unfortunately not native, but likely the one that you're gonna see most of the time. Certainly one that I find in my garden all the time as well as the two spotted ladybug. So easy to identify them. They literally have seven spots or two spots. The two spotted ladybugs are quite tiny. So you do have to have your eyes open to catch them, but they're super cute and they are native. Um, up at the top here, it's kind of hard to see, but that's actually a pink ladybug. And I had heard of them, but I hadn't seen them. And then a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a survey downtown for CMSRT and I found one in the gutter at the Bow, Bow Tower. Um, it was in the gutter there in the leaves. And so um, myself and the and my partner there, we took it out and we put it on a tree there and I took this picture. So it's hard to see, but that is actually quite pink. It has the weird name of cream spotted ladybug because there is nothing cream about this. However, there's a lot of different color morphs to this species. And so this one is more commonly known as the polka dot ladybug because obviously polka dot ladybug, pink polka dot, um, but the cream spotted variation of it is what it was named after. So this one, the one at the top there actually eats both um, nectar, all ladybugs actually do eat nectar and insects. The one at the top eats more nectar than other species. So having those late blooming flowers is going to help this guy um, make it through the winter by providing that sugar source, in addition to hopefully leaving some aphids for them to eat. Um, so everybody needs those aphids. The, the ladybugs all love their small insects. And because they are predatory, if it fits in their mouth, they're going to eat it. Um, so they overwinter as adults, and then they lay eggs in the spring and the summer. So you, if you leave that leaf litter, they tend to go underneath there. You can also buy ladybug houses. Um, I have one and have never found a ladybug overwintering in it, but that's not to say that they don't work. If you have it in the right spot, put some leaves inside of it, put some twigs, they may go in there and overwinter in there. Um, they'll also use other dead wood and cracks in homes, or as many people see, they often make their way inside. And you may hear about um, introduced Asian ladybugs that make their way into the home, and that's true, but we also do have native species that I have found overwinter in my home, like the two-spotted ladybug. So keep your eye out for the pink polka dot ladybug, and, and let me know if you find one, because they're super fun, and I was really excited to find it. So next, we'll move on to bees. So Alberta is actually home to at least 321 native species. That's how many have been documented in, in, uh, in Alberta, but that doesn't mean that's all that's here. Being that um, we're just getting a handle on, on understanding bees and solitary bees in particular, I think that number is probably gonna grow. So 27 of those are actually bumblebees. So the more, um, more similar to a honeybee in their behaviors and the rest are solitary. Bumblebees form colonies for the summer, but unlike honeybees, um, everybody but the queen new queens, next year's queens will, will die over winter. And uh, so a new colony is started each year, unlike with honeybees where the whole colony overwinters together. And as long as conditions are good, they should come back. So those are the introduced European honeybees rather than our native bumblebees. Um, some solitary bees will share nesting space occasionally, but they each take care of their own brood. So they're not sharing any duties, they're just sharing space. 
so they're not truly social. So if we look a little closer at solitary bees, um, so they might have different nest sites, but their life cycle is generally the same. So females will lay eggs in the ground, in plant stems, or in wood. So you can see where those plant stems are coming in if you leave them standing. Um, also having bare ground is definitely an asset for them. So mulching, I use lots of mulch in mine, which is great compost as well as ground cover to hold moisture in. But if you can leave some open dirt, that's gonna help the solitary bees and also where they uh, spend the winter as well. So once the eggs hatch, the larvae, larvae feed on the food that's left by their mother. So they usually leave what's called bee bread and it's a mixture of nectar and pollen and some other enzymes mixed in there and kind of like a little bread that they'll leave with each egg and then they will develop into a pupae and then adults. So similar to a butterfly's life cycle, they go through the same steps as well. However, with solitary bees, some species will remain dormant for months or even years awaiting ideal conditions. So whether it's warm enough or there's a drought happening or they need the right food to be blooming. So when we leave those plant stems, if there's an egg in it from two years ago, if we leave that plant stem, we're giving that bee an opportunity to survive. Whereas if we were to cut down every year, we take away those nesting spots and also the potential that there's already eggs in there. Um, but that life, life cycle trait that they have to remain dormant in that stage actually makes them more resilient to environmental change comparatively to things like honeybees, which can't, they can't do that. They, they live or they die season by season. So that, that gives solitary bees an opportunity to be um, more adaptable to the changes that we are seeing in our climate and in our um, weather patterns, particularly with the, the drought and shifting bloom times as well. So bumblebees, um, again, there's 27, I think it is, 27 bumblebee species in Alberta that have been recorded. And new colonies begin in the spring from a single adult female. So at the end of last year's season, um, new queens will go out, they will be fertilized by drone males, and then they will take those eggs within them and go and overwinter somewhere, and then they have eggs ready to go in the, in the next spring. So she'll search for a nest, which could be dead wood, old burrows from um, rodents, uh, birdhouses, or even under decks. And then as the season goes on, so she'll lay her eggs, and those will be female workers. And once she has her female workers, she concentrates on laying more and more eggs throughout the summer, which will be all females until it starts to get towards mid to late summer, at which point she'll lay the male eggs, which are unfertilized eggs. So it's kind of essentially cloning. And their sole job is nothing to do with colony care, nothing to do with food, nothing like that. Their sole job is to go and mate with new queens um, to start the next, next year's colonies. So at the end of the season, that new queen that will be next year's queen of the next colony is going to look for a place to overwinter, either in the ground or under leaf litter. Sometimes they will use birdhouses as well to overwinter in. Not usually the best plan for them because it usually gets too cold in there and they, they often can't make it. So something we don't necessarily think about in our yards, um, frogs and salamanders. Alberta's home to 10 amphibians, maybe 11. There's one that may or may not occur on the very southeastern edge of the province um, in the Crow's Nest Pass. Questionable whether it's there, but we do have four frogs, four toads, and two salamanders. In Calgary, we pretty much just have boreal chorus frogs and wood frogs. Um, Northern leopard frogs do not generally occur in, in Calgary, um, and Columbia spotted frogs as well do not generally occur in Calgary. For toads, we do get toads in the city, but again, they're pretty infrequent. And there's two salamanders, so the long-toed salamander, which you'll find more along the Rocky Mountains, and then tiger salamanders. Tiger salamanders can be found in the city and are often um, found in backyards, incidentally. So amphibians spend the winter as adults for the most part, and many of them spend that time on land. Salamanders may wait a year before they um, fully metamorphose into an adult. So you may find larvae from the previous year in a pond in the spring, but generally speaking, the adults um, are what we see in the winter. Well, we don't see them because they're um, overwintering in the ground or under leaf litter again. Now, some frogs, like wood frogs, like this guy on the bottom here, literally freeze. They actually turn into frog popsicles. Um, they have antifreeze within their cells that prevents damage from the cell itself, but otherwise they are literally frozen. 
and it's one of the coolest adaptations, I think. So they'll literally freeze like a frog popsicle and be underneath the ice. And then in the spring, as soon as it warms up, they thaw out and they're totally fine. Um, salamanders, they breed in ponds, but otherwise they spend their time on land, often in leaf litter or burrows, as I mentioned. Boreal chorus frogs also spend a lot of time on land as adults, and both of these species can be found away from their pond in the winter. So salamanders in particular are not migratory, but they migrate a short distance away, often um, often people's yards. So people will find like at the end of summer into fall, you might see people posting a salamander on Facebook saying, uh, I just found this in my yard. What is it and what do I do with it? Well, it's a tiger salamander, probably looking for a place to overwinter. And if you have the right habitat, you might get lucky. If you're near a wetland and you have leaf litter on the ground, you may get tiger salamanders uh, spending the winter with you. So I wish I don't have anything like that near me. I don't have a wetland close enough for that, but I can dream. And then there's the birds. Um, so chickadees and nuthatches are probably one of the most familiar winter residents that we have. In Alberta, we do have three chickadees, um, all of which can be found in Calgary as well. So we do have the, the most familiar black cap chickadees. We have mountain chickadees and boreal chickadees. If you wanna find the other two, if you go to the west side of the city, if you go to Weaselhead or Griffith Woods or even the west end of Fish Creek Park, you might get lucky and find the mountain chickadee and the boreal chickadee. I actually last Christmas Eve, um, I was in Weaselhead at the south end, at the, sorry, at the west end, and I had both of them. So I saw all three species in, in one shot. We also have two nut hatches, um, red-breasted and white-breasted. Now they do migrate a little bit between their summer and winter homes, but they all stay in Alberta for the winter. And they eat insects, spiders, caterpillars in the spring and summer, and then mostly seeds in the winter. And chickadees are prolific cachers. So that means they'll take seeds and hide them for later, for eating later. And it's estimated that they'll cache up to 100,000 seeds a year. Each chickadee, each black cap chickadee, 100,000 seeds per year. So if you're feeding the chickadees and you're wondering where all of your sunflower seeds went, I think there's a pretty good chance they took them and hid them somewhere so that the magpies can't find them and the sparrows can't eat them. And remarkably, they find most of them. Now, there is also an important part to caching um, where they don't remember. And if they have something that's a, a tree or a shrub and it's a viable seed, that may turn into a new tree or shrub, so or perennial as well. So you may end up with sunflower seeds that you didn't plant, but the chickadee planted them, and now you have um, new plants in your yard. So they're important for seed dispersal in that way. And keeping garden markers the same helps them find their caches. So there was a study that looked at how do chickadees find what they hid? Is it the arrangement of leaves around a spot or is it more like the trees, that sort of thing? And so it is those bigger markers. So again, leaving um, perennial standing is gonna help them find anything that they've planted that they've cached near and around that area. Nut hatches also cache and it's usually under bark in the snow or in lichen and moss. And during the winter, um, they will also eat insects that are overwintering underneath the bark, and they will scrounge in leaf litter looking for caterpillars or ladybugs or anything. Ladybugs are toxic, so not the ladybugs, but they will look for anything that's overwintering, beetles, that sort of thing, that are underneath the leaf litter that they can eat in the winter. Because protein is incredibly important, as we know, for their thermoregulation and, and keeping them going. So in addition to providing, if you do provide food, in addition to providing um, things like sunflowers, black oil, sunflower seeds, providing suet or even just mealworms in general is an excellent way to keep these guys going. They're, they're my favorite. And if you had to ask me if there should be a city bird, I feel like maybe a chickadee would be a good option, right, Kathleen? I think so. Uh, woodpeckers. <laughs> Oh, oh, you're muted. I can't. Oh, sorry. I can't hear you. Oh, oh, I hear I've unmuted. And um, since you're the guest, we'll let you go with that. Um, but I'm sure we have lots of members of Team Magpie here as well. Absolutely. Maybe we'll talk about, maybe we'll talk about Magpie. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk. <laughs> The woodpeckers. Uh, so Alberta is home to uh, six year-round woodpecker residents, 
and that includes northern flickers that can be seen on the bottom here, the giant pileated woodpecker that can be seen at the top, three-toed, black-backed, hairy, and downy woodpeckers. Um, now, hairy, downy, and flickers are probably what you're more likely to see in your backyard. If you get pileated, send them my way, please. Um, Three-toed and black-backed, you're probably not going to see in an urban backyard as much. They're, they're more sticking to those poplar woods and, uh, and more developed forests. But they all, all of these uh, woodpeckers eat insects, fruit and seeds, and depending on the season and availability, um, they're big ant eaters. All of them eat ants. Often flickers, you'll see them on the ground and they're kind of digging around. They eat ants as one of their main food sources. So if you have an ant hill and you're trying to get rid of it, maybe think about the flickers and maybe you want to keep it for them. Um, and ants, caterpillars, and other bark bug larvae are super important food sources. So when there's no ants, when they're in their underground habitat for the winter, they're gonna be digging around in that leaf litter looking for those caterpillars, looking for those beetles, looking for any kind of bugs that they can get. Um, and then of course, in the next spring when they're raising young, they need that even more. So having that available for them from the previous season is gonna help their brood next year get through. Um, another thing that you'll often see flickers doing in the winter, I was watching one today, is they'll go um, underneath the soffit on houses or underneath siding, they'll cling to the house and you'll see them kind of at the side. And they're looking for bugs that are in there. Lots of times we find spiders and, and all sorts of bugs hiding in there. So if you can resist the temptation to spray down your house in the fall, um, I know a lot of us like to clean off the siding as my husband said today. So basically you're telling me that we just are supposed to be lazy. That's, that's what's best. And I said, yes, that's exactly what's best for wildlife. Just leave it all alone and they'll take care of all the bugs, all the spiders, all that good stuff. So if you can avoid um, spraying your house, if you have um, that leaf litter on the ground, and if you can provide some suet as well, they love suet in the wintertime, as well as the black oil sunflower seeds, you're gonna help the woodpeckers get through the season and they're always fun to have around. However, I do realize that some people do not appreciate them um, drumming into the side of their houses. Now, if it's a matter of them finding food in there, um, that could be a sign of um, dead wood in your house and you may wanna have that looked at and you may have to replace some of that wood. Or they may be looking to excavate a nest hole, in which case you're going to want to um, provide them with an artificial nesting site. It means that there's probably not a lot of suitable habitat in the area for them to nest. And you can get flicker houses from places like the Wild Bird Store. And uh, yeah, they can, they can move in there and that's a lot easier for them instead of drilling into the side of your house. So they will drill into things like they will make nests uh, habitat inside of old poplars as well. Um, so if you're near like a river habitat that has lots of poplars along it, or if you're in one of the older neighborhoods in Calgary with a lot of poplars, that may be their first go-to, or they may come to your house as well. And now we'll talk about corvids because I couldn't do this for Kathleen without mentioning the magpies. Uh, so corvids. <laughs> <laughs> Corvids are something that does stay, generally speaking, year round in Alberta. Um, crows do tend to migrate further south, but we'll find ravens, blue jays, and magpies in the city um, throughout the year. Um, I've never seen a gray jay or a stellar's jay in the city. They are in Alberta, just, just maybe not um, frequent visitors to, to backyards. Um, and they are all omnivorous, so they'll eat whatever they can find. Seeds, fruit, bugs, rodents, garbage that's left unsealed, that sort of thing. Um, so if you can provide them with better options like peanuts for blue jays, um, or again, the suet or seeds, um, we can keep them out of the garbage. They are actually beneficial to have in your yard for um, a few reasons. One is that rodent control. They, ravens in particular, are not, not averse to taking a mouse. They're, they will go hunting, actively hunting, and they will take out mice. Um, also, they will actually chase away other predators. Not to say that predators shouldn't be in your backyard, as they should, but um, this bottom guy here is a sharp shinned hawk. And the other day, twice actually in the past week, I have watched magpies chase a sharp shinned hawk away from the yard. So, yes, the sharp shinned hawk does need to eat. 
Um, but on that day, it wasn't going to get any of my chickadees or my finches from the backyard because the magpie has now protected them. Um, they also do play an important role as scavengers, so they're helping prevent disease spread, um, spreading to a lot of other potential things um, like dogs, cats. They can help prevent parasites from, from reaching them by eating anything that's on the ground, that rodent control, and also returning nutrients to the soil to help um, with nutrient cycling. So providing fresh water, food, and shelter during the winter will help them survive. They're not generally, they're a little loud, but they're, they're no louder than the teenagers on my street. So they're more than welcome in my yard. Um, bats. So bats are not necessarily something that we think about in the fall and winter because we think, okay, they've, they're gone. They're, they're sleeping, they're done. So that's true. But when you think about what they're gonna need next spring when they wake up, maybe we can think about them in our garden planning. So Alberta is home to nine bat species with three of them, um, silver hair bat, oh shoot, red, red backed, oh no, red back bat and uh, hoary bats all leave province, but there are six that actually stay within the province. They may shift between their summer and winter roosts, but they do stay. And that includes the big brown bat, um, little brown myotis, long-legged myotis, long-eared myotis, uh, western small-footed, and northern myotis or bat that hibernate in the province. So they do all hibernate. However, um, sometimes conditions are warm enough that they might wake up midwinter, or unfortunately they may catch a fungus um, called white nose syndrome, known as white nose syndrome, which can cause them to wake up in the middle of winter. And that can cause potentially death because they can starve to death if they wake up and there's no food available. And it also causes them to use up a lot of energy to wake up from hibernation. So luckily, because most of these bats roost either um, by themselves or in small groups, they're less susceptible than a lot of bats that you find in Eastern Canada and the United States. So luckily they're less likely to have it um, here, but it's still a potential potential issue to think about. Um, but winter roosting sites for all of these bats are often in buildings or in tree crevices. And again, maybe a few to a few several hundred individuals depending on the species. And while we know that they eat a lot of mosquitoes and a lot of moths, other insects like spiders on vegetation and aphids and all of those sorts of things that live on, on beetles on, um, on trees and leaves are also super important, especially when aerial insect populations are low. So if we're in the middle of a drought or it's early spring and ponds are still um, iced over and there's no insects hatching, no mosquitoes coming up or no uh, flies coming up from the water, those tree insects or vegetation insects are gonna be what they have to eat. So again, leaving your siding um, unsprayed and letting those spiders live underneath can definitely help the bats or leaving the aphids, leaving your plants not cut down so that aphids continue to be there or beetles continue to be there. You will not see bats hanging out in the leaf litter. If you find a bat on the ground, that bat has become stranded. They need height to take off. So if you find a bat on the ground, um, either it fell from somewhere and it needs you to put it back or it's in distress and needs to be taken to a wildlife rehabilitation facility. Squirrels. I find that people either love squirrels or hate squirrels. And when it comes to gardeners, it really is a love-hate relationship because they can maybe eat some things you don't want them to. Maybe they dig up some of your bulbs. Maybe they make a little bit of a nuisance sometimes, but I still like them in my yard. Um, we have two native squirrel species here in Alberta, the red squirrel and the northern flying squirrel. You can find flying squirrels within the city of Calgary if you go to the right natural areas. Uh, Griffith Woods, Weaselhead or Fish Creek are ones that I know that they've seen them in. Um, if you find them, consider yourself lucky. It's a pretty lucky sighting. You're probably not gonna find them in your urban backyard. But um, red squirrels, you will find them in your yard along with the introduced um, Eastern or Western gray squirrels. They're very similar, Eastern and Western. Most of the ones that we have are Eastern, um, a botched introduction from the zoo on that one. We got uh, gray squirrels at the zoo and for some reason they decided they didn't want them in captivity and just let them go. And yeah, this was a long time ago. 
But now we have uh, gray squirrels in all of our natural areas and they are a frequent backyard visitor. They do generally eat seeds, but they also love fruit and they'll eat suet and little known fact, they eat bird eggs as well. Um, but they're also super important for seed dispersal. So they're helping plants grow by taking seeds and caching them, just like the chickadee. Um, they have an incredible ability to hide seeds and find them, but the seeds that they don't find can grow into new trees and shrubs and perennials. So you may find something that was planted by a squirrel in your yard and um, yeah, consider yourself lucky if you get that sort of thing. Kathleen, I see you're making an appearance. Hey, well, we actually have a question in the chat here. What type of fruit is preferred for the squirrels? Which actually I was wondering too, that's a great question. That is a good question. Um, so if we're talking like in the summertime, when there's fresh fruit available, um, they'll now down on your strawberries, your raspberries, blueberries, Saskatoons. Um, if we're talking in the winter time, if you're going to provide dried fruit for them, maybe. Um, yeah, you can give them like raisins again, blueberries, they'll eat those. Kind of any of that, that dried fruit that comes in, like dried cranberries is a good choice as well. Um, the dried fruit, of course, isn't going to freeze the same way that like a berry that has moisture inside of it is. So that's that's mm -hmm. why I'm saying the dried fruit. But yeah, raisins and, and cranberries are a good choice in the winter time. That's a good, yeah. And I guess just to make sure that they're kind of more of a naturally dried without too many preservatives and things like that. But that too. I suppose, because I don't eat a lot of dried fruit myself, but no, I could be wrong. I did have <laughs> one other question here on uh, with the red squirrels. Is it true that they actually can create shelters under mounds of needles underneath the pine trees? Do you know about uh, that? So usually what you're seeing underneath there is called their midden. So midden. that's actually where they're they are storing. That's kind of like a storage facility for them. So they probably have their home up in that tree and they've taken a whole bunch of food and they've hidden it in their midden. And if you're in somewhere like Kananaskis or um, Banff, you may find that bears like to find squirrel middens in the springtime because that's just an easy food source and they'll dig those up. Um, you may also find from red squirrels, um, mushrooms in weird places. So if you ever see a mushroom in a tree, probably a squirrel. <laughs> they like to dry them out and then they store them. Oh, Go that figure. is so interesting. So I guess that's a good idea not to clear out under our pine trees like we see a lot of people doing. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. If Well, especially if they have like an obvious hill underneath there, that's probably a squirrel midden and that's, that's his winter storage. They may um, also you know, go into your attic or things like that. Um, I have a family member who has removed a lot of squirrels from his, his roof and relocated them. Um, I don't advocate relocating wildlife because you're often putting them into unfamiliar territory and hurting their chances of survival. So if you find yourself with squirrels where you don't want them, um, if you know they're not in there, like if it's during the day and they're out foraging and you know nobody's in there, you can block that area off with a thick chicken wire, um, a very thick layer of it, or you can fill it in like the, the place I, I'm aware of has roofing that has holes underneath it, like it's one of the wavy ones, so they're going in through there. So if you can cover that up with chicken wire, you're going to lessen the chances of them getting in there and also providing an alternative habitat. So if you have dead trees in your yard, they will use those, um, or you can provide a nest box. In the springtime, um, yes, they can get into bird boxes, and yes, they can kill the birds inside of it, but you can also create a bird or a squirrel specific habitat, and if it's suitable for them, they'll move in. So there is always the risk with squirrels um, and other animals as well. You'll also get corvids will also kill baby birds and other songbirds will kill other songbirds. So mm -hmm. it's kind of how it goes. And it's a, it's a give and take on what wildlife you're, you're okay having in your yard, I guess. But. I think that's a really good point that you made about looking at what the animal is needing. It's one thing to block the entrance to keep the squirrel from entering, but it's going to just it just needs shelter. That's all it needs. The same with the flickers. They're just looking for shelter for the winter. And, and so instead of just trying to block them, think, well, what do they need? Because there's not a lot of dead trees in our, our suburbs. And uh, so putting up nest boxes, leaving up a dead tree, as long as it's not, you know, dangerous, leaving those yeah. things that 
Yeah, really, really helpful. So I'm really glad that you pointed that out. Not to mention leaving the dead trees is also excellent habitat for insects to overwinter in. And so you're helping provide food for next season too. Right. But yeah. it may be an aesthetic thing as well. Um, a lot of people don't like the look of a dead tree in your yard and that's totally understandable. But if you can provide an artificial habitat for in, in lieu of, if you don't want to keep that dead tree there, you're going to make the wildlife a lot happier and prevent problems like having them going and looking into different spots that you don't want them or your neighbors don't want them as well. Awesome. So with that said, let's move on to one of my favorites, skunks. <laughs> um, so skunks, just like Kathleen said, they're another one that um, you can remove them, you can fence off an area, but as long as there is suitable habitat nearby or another resource that they need, skunks will still be in the area. So um, removing a skunk from an area is not going to solve your problem. I always advocate for keeping them because they are excellent pest control and they're not generally speaking bothering you um, unless they spray you, which, yep, it can happen. Um, so it's estimated that about 70% of their diet is actually beneficial to people. So they're eating things like the mice and the voles and the, um, I've forgotten the name of them, the cutworms and also the, uh, the mounders, the the worms that make, oh shoot, I forgot the name. Anyways, the ones that make mounds in your lawn that, um, that drive a lot of people crazy, they're eating all of those things. So they're providing benefit to your garden by taking out the things that you were trying to get rid of with chemicals or with pest control companies as it is. Um, so they are very common urban backyard visitors. Um, they are omnivorous and again, often eating unwanted residents like slugs. They are welcome in my yard. They take out the slugs in my yard and they're welcome because of that. Um, now in the winter time, they do go into torpor, but they will come up and forage if it's warm enough. So they don't go into true hibernation. Their body temperature only lowers a couple of degrees. So when it gets warm out, they can easily wake up and then come out and forage. So in the middle of winter, there may still be snow on the ground, but if it's warm enough, they will come out and start looking for something. So again, if that leaf litter is there, they can forage in there and look for insects in there. They can find the slugs, they can find the worms, they can find all of the things that they want to eat in there. Do um, worms. If that's, do worms, thank you. Do worms, Jamie, that's the one. Jamie gets surprised there. <laughs> thank you, Jamie, that's the one, do worms. Um, so they do, if they don't have that food available and they're up to forage, that's when they're going to start getting into trouble and picking through people's garbage. Generally speaking, animals will stick to their natural diet unless it's not available. So I actually was surprised that the skunks weren't eating my strawberries or anything this summer. They were in the yard all the time at night, but they were eating uh, protein. So they were eating the insects. They're definitely eating the slugs. Um, so they're again, welcome in my yard, but they do den under steps and decks and sheds. And they'll either do that alone or in family groups. In the springtime, um, usually males and females will separate and get a little bit more territorial as the females getting ready to give birth. And males are often the ones that will spend the winter by themselves, but they might den up with a female in their territory as well. And if you see baby skunks, um, try not to move any skunks. If they're denning under your step and you see baby skunks, please don't move them if there's baby skunks because you're going to risk orphaning um, these cute little things and then they're gonna get euthanized probably because they're, well, actually that's not true. They can be rehabilitated. They can be raised in captivity and released, but it's not ideal. It's best if mom can do it. If you find a loan kit at any point, they're in need of some help and that's when you need to call a wildlife rehab as well. But having said that, um, you probably won't see them because they're active mostly at night. So if you do have them in your area, you may not even know they're there because they're so secretive. They don't generally smell. Yes, sometimes you can smell a bit of an odor, but you can't, they're not creating a big odor or issue, generally speaking. If you have dogs, it can be an issue. So often um, skunks don't actually have very good eyesight. And they often become so focused on what they're doing that they're not paying attention to anything else going on when they're foraging. So it's easy to let your dog out and your dog just comes upon it, surprises it and gets sprayed. So turning on a light or making noise before you send your dog out or you yourself go out is gonna prevent you from having any 
any issues down the road. My dog hilariously got sprayed this summer. I know it's not that hilarious, but it is hilarious because she got sprayed and she, then she came in and the next time the skunk was in the yard and we let her out, she learned her lesson and she turned right back around and came back inside. So dogs do learn their lessons and hopefully only get sprayed the one time. So if you are not seeing them and they're only uh, out at night, how do you even know you have them? Well, you can put out a camera. Um, so this is actually part of another study with CMSRT where we're doing a roaming cat study where we have cameras in yards. And I, I thought it would be fun to also set up this puzzle that I got from my dog, which basically involves um, two step process for the dog to get treats. And so we went away for the weekend and I left this puzzle in front of the camera thinking that the magpies or the blue jay would figure it out. We got back and all of the peanuts were still in there. They did not figure it out. I guess there was too much else available for them elsewhere to even bother trying to figure out a puzzle. But um, then Skunk showed up and I watched Skunky eat some peanuts on camera and then Skunky went away and brought back a friend. So it turns out we actually have two skunks in our yard and they don't cause any problems to me. We do know where they den. It's not in our yard, but we're okay with them being in the neighborhood and nobody else around us seems to have an issue either. So they're good, good backyard, uh, backyard friends if you can get them. And with that, um, I'm done talking. I, I talked a lot. So if anybody has any questions, um, please do let me know or we can have any other any other chat in there as well. I know Kathleen, you're ready. I can see it. Oh, you know I always have questions. Absolutely. And we have a good crew here today too. So feel free to unmute and you know, and if you want to ask questions directly. Feel free if if you're shy. If you want to put the message, you can do that too. Uh, it's good to see so many here. Um, I did have one question. While everybody gets all ready for theirs, where is a good place to responsibly find some deadwood to add into your garden? Because I think you mentioned about you know if if you do have a tree, it may not be aesthetically pleasing, but you can. You know, even if you find a, a small log or something to be able to put in in the corner and let it rot and do its thing. That is a good point. We don't um, want to go and poach from Kananaskis, but no. where um, <laughs> where should <laughs> where can we go other than to like Alan's backyard and, and take his wood pile? Well, that is a good option, actually, is if um, somebody has recently cut down a tree, you can always ask if you can take some of that wood and bring it in. Um, sometimes garden centers do have dead wood available. I cannot advocate taking it out of the wild. And definitely in Calgary, it is illegal to remove anything from our, particularly Fish Creek is a provincial park, so that's illegal. Um, and it is, it's highly frowned upon to remove anything from our other natural areas. So don't do that. Um, if there is any areas, like if there's, um, there are areas where it's legal to take, um, to cut down a tree in places like Kananaskis, there are some legal um, crown land where you can collect things like that. So that could be a good option. But I would say looking at um, retailers or if you know of somebody who's just cut down some, a tree or anything. That's you may point. also be able to call the city. They might also have um, an idea of where you could get some dead wood because obviously they cut down trees in the city as well. And I don't don't know what they do with that wood. I assume they mulch it, but it might be worth looking at. Good question, well, Kathleen. I don't know. <laughs> well, thanks. And actually, Jamie uh, commented there too. And Jamie, you're more than welcome to um, to come on screen there too. But um, Jamie had mentioned that uh landscapers may be able to provide uh some some wood too so if you have a no landscaper because they're cutting trees down and and such and it sounds like from what you're saying sarah once we kind of get our garden where we want it to try to position everything and then leave those items so that in case somebody's caching food or if it is rotting into place maybe be creating shelter for something really tiny that we can't see yeah um, and yeah. also that dead wood is also providing nutrients back into the soil um, mm -hmm. they've actually found that dead or dying trees are sending out nutrients to 
often um, their own their own kin in a forest, but often not. So they might be sharing nutrients with plants in your garden, purposely sending nutrients through the roots that they're connected with um, underneath in the soil. So leaving things that are, are dead or dying is going to help the rest of the growth in your yard as well. Hmm. Wonderful. Unless and it's a species like a black walnut. Don't do that because they actually have a chemical that they um, stop the growth of anything around them. So don't don't oh. let them stand. If they're if they're dying, probably just take them. <laughs> You're so probably not I, sharing with anybody. <laughs> if you look at my garden and I've done a terrible job, I'll just say oh, I, I put a black walnut. It's a bad idea. It's not my garden. Yeah, there you it's go. Black walnut <laughs> and the black walnut. Um, we've got oh, we've got some good questions here. Let me see. So yeah, so Jamie, Jamie said, ask would some landscapers, we cut wood often. I have another question here in the chat. Um, what about the rabbits in, in Calgary? What habitat do they need? Now that's a really good question and an interesting one because we might want to touch on the fact that there are some domesticated rabbits that we see around the city, especially down by Stampede Park and in that area. And they look like a pet rabbit. Um, yes. And that is what they, they were, were pet rabbits. And then there's the hares, because I believe there are two species of hares, wild hare. Yes. Right. Right. Well, there's the, the white-tailed prairie hares, which is what we're commonly seeing like in our urban streets here. Um, right. And in the natural areas, you'll find snowshoe hares as well. Um, so generally speaking, and then there's also cottontails as well. And to be honest, I'm not overly confident on the difference between snowshoe and cottontail. Um, so I would leave that to a, a rabbit hair expert, um, <laughs> but yes, that's an excellent point, Kathleen. We do have a lot of feral domestic rabbit populations in the city. They're, like you said, they're down by Stampede Grounds. Um, they're over here by me in Seton and also in Cranston, and they're, they're all over the city. And unfortunately, those are domestic rabbits that have been at some point let go and done what rabbits do and multiplied. So they over winter are probably going to den in the ground. So they're going to be active all winter. They don't go to, into torpor or anything like that. Um, they will den in the ground. Whereas a hare is more likely to be in side vegetation or, um, or also they'll kind of dig themselves a little hole in the snow if it's deep enough. They'll make a little a hole in the snow to keep themselves warm. And obviously because they do do their best to blend into the snow, they can create a hazard if you are driving as well. So, so keeping an eye out for hares on the side of the road. Sometimes they go under cars, but often they are um, under vegetation if they can, if it's available. Right. But yes, oh. that's a good point. So interesting. And if you see a baby hare in the spring by itself, if it, you see a hare, leave it there <laughs> unless it's definitely injured. Correct. Um, well, yeah, we have yeah. some for up to 12 hours. Up to 12 All on hours. Their own. Up to 12 hours she'll feed them in the morning and at night generally and then she leaves them alone for the rest of the day and i think there there was a viral picture going around of a clutch of baby baby wild rabbits and i think it's a bit deceiving for albertans i see we have somebody from edmonton here too you're also welcome here uh, even if you like the oilers um <laughs> For, for the rabbits or the wild hares that we have in Alberta, I think that they're, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're more inclined to leave their young in singles as not to leave all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. So I think that that's where people think, you know, you're imagining this little bundle of bunnies and you find a lone one they, to think it's in trouble, but that's actually, I think, intentional because then you have if there's a coyote, it might get one of your babies, but if it's separated, it's not going to get all of them, hopefully. I, it, am I right on that? Because you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. No, oh, you're right. And again, um, the difference between, one of the differences between rabbits and hares is that rabbits are born um, much like a kitten. They're blind and hairless um, when mm. they're born. And so they need to be kept underground because they're not developed. Whereas a baby hair is born fully functioning. It's like a little mini hair, right? It's exactly like it's the little, it, what you find in your garden is what it was born as, right? It was born ready to go. Um, of course, it still needs its mom to feed it, but it's, it's got its eyes open, it's fully furred. 
It's much uh -huh. different than the baby rabbits, which again would likely be in a den underneath a deck or a shed or underground somewhere. Whereas the hares, like you said, they're above ground and mom does spread them out for that exact reason, predators. If a predator finds one, it didn't find the whole litter. Mom also spends not a lot of time around them because she has a scent, they don't. Um, there is a myth though, that if you touch that baby hair, mom's gonna reject it. That's not true. If you've touched the hair and you, you picked it up and you said, oh, look, it's abandoned. And then somebody told you, no, it's not, put it back. Mom will still take it, it'll be fine. <laughs> Another great point, and same with baby birds. If it falls out of the nest, birds. put it back. Yeah, great, back. great point. Wow, glad I was taking notes before. Uh, I have another excellent question. Oh, and Pez is here to help. Uh, what is the best time to rake leaves in the spring? And Pez doesn't know either, so. So with that, that luck, I always uh, wonder about that because I now I'm phobic of everything I do in the garden because. Yeah. Well, and chances are, no matter when you rake them, you are probably going to rake up some insects. It's going to happen. Um, with any luck, a lot of that has composted over the winter, and so it's already broken down, and you should have less leaves in the spring than you did in the fall. But waiting until the temperatures are reliably warm and things like bees that may have been um, under the ground and also ladybugs can be active and can have moved. So if you're raking them in the spring and it's warm enough that ladybugs could be active, you're probably okay. I say ladybugs because that's like the, the one that we all think about. But um, morning cloaks usually come out around May. If you can wait until May, sometimes they're earlier than that. If it's nice, it might be April and sometimes March, but generally when it's reliably warm and bugs could get away, um, that's a good time. Also, if you do rake your leaves in the spring and put them in your compost bin, but leave the compost bin open for a while, any insects that are going to be flying insects can get out of there. So if you accidentally raked up a butterfly, it could get out. That's a good point. Now, when you say morning cloak, you're not talking about Harry Potter. I am right? not. Okay. No. Do you it's mind explaining that? Because I just learned that recently from one of Chris Fisher's posts on Twitter about about them and about morning cloth butterflies yeah and what they do over winter you mean like that they that they overwinter as an adult underneath the leaf litter mm -hmm. and then yeah and then in the springtime they're one of the first um there are some fritillaries as well and a couple of other ones um tortoiseshell tortoiseshell butterflies sorry are the ones the first ones that come out so they're overwintering as a full adult underneath leaf litter and anywhere else um, you can get butterfly houses i don't think they're going to use them anywhere where they have enough warmth underneath that they're not going to completely freeze because they're not they're not quite like the frogs they don't as far as i know i could be very wrong um but as far as i know they don't have that antifreeze so they can't uh, be completely frozen so they need a little bit of that that hmm. pocket of warmth underneath the leaves and then they'll become active first thing in the spring. Oh, interesting. Even more motivation to keep lots of leaves around. Definitely. Oh, let's see. So can you remind us when when is the early well if we if for me with a poor memory, wait till well, March is probably going to be still too cold anyways, like yeah. you're probably still going to have snow on the ground. Um, mm -hmm. Once the snow has all melted, when it's reliably warm enough that insects could be active. So if it's warm during the day and they could be active, you're probably safe to do it. Keeping in mind, no matter when you do it, there's probably going to be some, some casualties, but yeah. so it goes. <laughs> That's just how it goes. I do a kind of a couple stage process where I push them over there and then I push them over there and then eventually into the compost. So hopefully they've all vacated by the time, you know, in seven years when I finally get rid of the pile. Oh, so great question here too. Keep them coming. It's excellent. because so we've got another 20 minutes and don't, we don't have a hard stop. So if people have questions, I, I did joke with Sarah that I clipped off one leaf out of every one of my plants in the garden to sit here and ask her to please identify each of the plants in my garden but i'm just kidding but if you do have any questions but i said no <laughs> sarah actually um thanks to to her knowledge was you know you really did help me to get my garden switched over i don't know what percentage but a lot more native plants 
and I'm so excited to see in the spring when they start to come back, see what things I didn't kill and, and to see what comes back. And um, like the sweet grass is already like within a month, there were these little sticks oh, and I nice. thought, and now there, there's got to be 15 plants. Wow. That grown off the, just a couple of stems of sweet grass. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. Um, so yeah, there's lots of questions to be had for you, Sarah, for sure. Were leopard frogs ever in Alberta? Anne asks, I thought one of the frog species, uh, they are still in Alberta. Yes. Leopard frogs. Um, they were and still are in Alberta, but they are an endangered species. So there's Western and Eastern populations and the Western le Northern leopard frog um, is, is an endangered species in Alberta. It's not, it, you probably did see it a lot in the 70s and 80s, Anne, um, but it's, it's very sensitive to environmental change and um, also was used in a lot of science experiments. So they went through a drastic population decline. Um, and also now they do face the risk from an introduced um, bullfrog that eats both the tadpoles and adults. So there's, that's more in BC than Alberta. We don't have many of the bullfrogs, but yes, it is an endangered species in Alberta. Hmm, wow. But yes, still does exist. And the Calgary Zoo does have a Northern Leopard Frog recovery program. So worth looking at. Oh yeah, and you can volunteer for that too, I believe. I don't know. Probably. Maybe. Yeah, probably. Maybe not. not. Sure. Maybe. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe check it out before you sign up and take a week off to do it and find out you can. Um, Connie mentions having at least two hairs in their neighborhood up in Edmonton. That is interesting. It has social or hairs. Do they do they stick together? Like when we see them in the spring, there's like seven of them chasing around each other. Do they stick together at all or are they completely solitary except for when they're mating? Yeah, usually solitary except for mating. Okay. Although you may find like groups of them, if there's enough resources available, you might see groups of two or three, but it's probably more likely to see one. Yeah. Okay. Unless they're mating and all the males are chasing each other and attacking each other. <laughs> then there's that. Then there's that. And now Travis is new to the area. Welcome, Travis. Uh, we planted garlic not long ago. Are there critters that might be interested in digging the garlic up? So... Travis, are you hoping they're going to dig up the garlic? Because some of us can help you out with that garlic. Uh, if you're hoping to protect the garlic, that is a great question. Yeah, is there anything that likes to eat garlic other than us? Um, no, I'm my happy. dog? If I send my puppy over to you, she dug up some of my hmm. garlic this past spring. Um, she. But hopefully not. She's not going to do that again, I hope. Um, squirrels might. Squirrels might dig up your garlic. Um, and potentially bunnies but more likely, um, yeah, squirrels might. Hmm. Okay. They, they like to dig up bugs. I, I heard a really interesting thing about squirrels too, when you mentioned that, about when you're putting out food for, for squirrels, like peanuts, like oftentimes we'll buy a tin of peanuts ourselves and eat them. And obviously you want to avoid salted foods and things like that. But one thing I hadn't thought about is you want to avoid things. And Sarah, you could probably, you've already given us some ideas with the dried fruits and stuff, but apparently you want to avoid things that might go rancid, um, like peanuts that have oil and you know, they've been cooked in oil. Um, as I felt really badly, I had no idea. It's kind of like feeding bread to ducks. I did not know until recently that if you give these types of peanuts, put them out for uh, squirrels, and then they take these like oiled nuts or roasted nuts and they squirrel them away for the winter. And, you know, a couple of months later, they go to eat them and they may have gone rancid and it can actually spoil their whole, their whole clutch of food that they were depending upon. Have, have you heard of that? Like, cause I, it was, I can't yeah. remember who told me that, but I thought, oh man, the things that we don't think of sometimes, right? Yeah. That's why I like having like the black oil sunflower seeds in the shell and also like peanuts mm -hmm. in the shell, um, less likely to, to go rancid. I think the risk with anything like, um, sunflower seeds out of the shell, which I do have, but I also have them in the shell. Um, yeah, you, you run the risk of things going rancid, particularly with our, our heat or our thaw freeze cycles in in calgary mm. yeah moisture and things and yeah mm. so it's best if you can do it in the shell okay thank you 
Let's see. Uh, Jamie commented the, the jackrabbits make little dugouts beneath their shrubs, enjoy eating their garden through winter. Well, thanks, Jamie, for feeding the jackrabbits. Um, sure, she definitely uh, needs to. Do. <laughs> Connie hasn't followed uh, hockey in decades except for the Olympics. Good job, Connie. We'll get you on the flame side before long. And Alan asks, Sarah, you can help answer this. Alan asks, where did I get my sweet grass? And, and I'll uh, just start this out by, by mentioning, because Sarah, you'll, you'll go into more details, but when Sarah did assist me, because I wasn't able to get out too much, and uh, you know, with the programming that we're doing and plus working and such, and uh, Sarah kindly delivered a number of native plants that I had ordered, and very thoughtfully added to my order some sweetgrass and a sweetgrass and some sage because it's sacred to um, indigenous peoples, which is something that is important to me. And I just thought that was incredibly thoughtful. And, and I have a little special spot in the garden where I put that and some seashells and things, because that was all around when they found the 215 children at loop. So it all kind of came together at a, a time. Um, it was extremely meaningful and it meant a lot to me that you thought of uh, including that in the order because I didn't know what to order because <laughs> I'm just learning. Um, so that was great. And so, yeah, do you want to explain to everybody, especially Alan, uh, about great places to get things like sweetgrass and other native plants. Um, yes, so the sweetgrass specifically came from Wild About Flowers Native Plant Nursery. Um, it is located just south of Okotoks towards Black Diamond. Um, that's the only one that I'm aware of that has sweetgrass and you do have to buy it as plugs. Apparently it's very difficult to grow from seed, but from um, from cuttings, you can grow it like you can separate them, separate out the sweet grass itself, and it's it's easy to proliferate that way. So that is available at Wild About Flowers. Um, there is also in um, just north of Calgary by Bears Paw, there is ALCLA Native Plant Nursery. They're a really great place as well, and they have some different plants to Wild About Flowers. Um, they do more like industrial landscaping things, so they have more plants, um, they have a lot of plants that are for your garden, but they also have plants that you might see out in like prairie fields. So they do like prairie restoration stuff. So they have kind of more of the vetches and that sort of thing comparatively to um, wild about flowers. If you are up north, there is um, in Edmonton. Oh, no. What is it called now? Pro no. Um, oh, boy. Hang on. There is a lady in Edmonton that um, that does uh, flowers as well, native flowers. She's a smaller business. I am just going to look her up because I wouldn't want to. Yeah, go for it. Wouldn't want to not give her a plug. Um, Pardon the pun. Huh. <laughs> 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 I did. I did. She wants there. to give you plugs. One, right. <laughs> Thank you for um, the laugh, Jamie. So we appreciate the very bad <laughs> sense is. of humor. Arnica wildflowers. There we go. So Arnica wildflowers <laughs> in um, Edmonton. Sorry, what was it called? I was laughing. Arnica wildflowers. Arnica wildflowers. And I should Arnica let everybody know too that Marissa is very kindly putting together an information sheet uh, that will be emailed out to everyone. If we have your email address, that we'll be able to send that out to you after. So if, uh, if you're concerned that we don't have your email address, you can send an email to Calgary Response. Actually, you know, we have a different email address to use. You can use Calgary Response at gmail.com and I'll forward it over and we'll make sure that you're on the list. And um, and yeah, the the resources that Sarah is mentioning and some of the names of different plants and nurseries and such will be will be on there. Thanks for doing that, Marissa. And Anne groaned at my joke. That's just it is a groan. Uh, oh, there's, there's, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say, if you're looking for trees or shrubs, um, Bull Point Nursery or Wright Nurseries are excellent places with native plants, with native trees and shrubs. And was it, we've talked about native trees before that in Calgary, I guess the number of species of trees per se is fairly limited for native species. So is that what you were saying? Yeah, there's not a lot of native trees, but there's a ton of native shrubs um, and poplars. If you are not adverse to poplars, if you have the space for them, they are a fantastic, um, fantastic for for wildlife, not just insects, but also yeah, bats and birds as well. 
and willows if you want butterflies get willows a lot of a lot of caterpillars need need to eat willow oh yeah and actually do you mind just reminding on and i see another question which is great i think that one thing that you and you know um Lori and, and some of the speaks that we've had on you've really taught me this year is about changing our thinking from oh it's good to have birds because they control the bugs or the bats they control the bugs to changing our thinking around that we need bugs because birds need them to survive and, and I think that's just something that we, we have a lot of work to do to change our our mind frame around that because even like our next door neighbors I love them and well they might be on the call um but they have lots of ants in the front yard and you know I see the white powder coming out which lots of people do right tons of people so it's not no judgment against them because the stuff gets sold it's being sold because you know that's what people do and and then I see flickers coming in because they know that's where to find the ants. And and so I think we just really need to change our change our philosophy. Like because now when I see insects, I've always liked bugs, but but now I don't worry about aphids. Oh, well, there's aphids. That's like, oh, right on. If a hummingbird shows up, I've got aphids. I'm ready. And, and same with the, uh, with ants, it's like, there's so many species and the more I get down on the ground and learn about all the specific ones, the more interesting they are. And the more exciting it is to know, to be able to preserve some of these species, even if they're tiny. And ants, a lot of people think that ants are going to destroy your plants and they're going to kill them all. And you need to get rid of ants, but they're actually in a lot of ways, they help, um, your garden overall, they aerate the soil, um, they do transport a lot of seeds around so that you may get stuff growing where you didn't plant it. And that's thanks to the ants. Um, and by providing aeration in the soil, they also provide an area for water retention. So they're helping your drought um, resiliency in your yard and also helping control a lot of the pests as well. So they eat wasps, they eat, um, aph well, they farm aphids. I shouldn't say they eat aphids. They, let's not skip that. Let's just skip that one. But they, um, they yeah, they, they take care of a lot of, a lot of things. They're part of the, the predatory um, full life cycle in your, in your garden. They're important for plants and they're an important food source for a lot of things. And they themselves eat a lot of things as well. So they're an important thing to have in your garden. Yeah, they have got tons and they're not, they're not hurting anything. That's for sure. So wow interesting oh thank you you're good till 10 right or 11 oh, sure. yeah, good sure. go ahead okay we see one person asking for the resource page yes thank you um i think i've heard of arnica if it's the one i'm thinking of the advertised with sales every so often on the edmonton wildflowers facebook group yep, ah that's great one. Okay, that's a great tip is to go and, and and I think that's really important is to find really responsible groups to associate with to learn more about these things because I can see that especially in social media you'll see one group that talks about insects in terms of oh, oh no you've got that eradicate it and but then another one will be like no no no. <laughs> It's feeding hummingbirds. It's doing this. It's super interesting. It's, you know, like, and it doesn't have to have a purpose in order to um, deserve to live, obviously, <laughs> but, but you, you can see different um, perspectives from different groups that you start to associate with. So I think that's a great idea to join something like the Edmonton Wildflowers Facebook group. Um, and you've got a website, Sarah, uh, that people can read and follow. And then you just learn more and more in the right direction. And you go down a rabbit hole and suddenly you're starting your own business like I did. <laughs> hey, nice. That is awesome. I see one question here. Do you recommend nematodes for leaf miner on birch trees? Um, I honestly can't speak to that. I would say like for, um, yeah. I don't really know a lot about nematodes, to be honest, like introducing nematodes to your garden. So I would not advocate that just because I don't know enough about it. Um, I've heard varying 
different opinions on nematodes because a lot of them are not a native species that they are introduced that they're going to upset um, native insect balances and they're not necessarily specific to a particular insect that they're going to eat and they may in turn accidentally be clearing your garden of um, beneficial insects so i think it's one of those ones that they probably could help but you need to be cautious that they're only going to take out the leaf miners and not going to take out other beneficial insects or um, also keeping in mind that leaf miners as, as um, irritating as they can be are also a really great food source for birds um, and other predatory insects as well so it's one yeah. of those things um yeah it's one of those things yeah. that probably you want to research a bit more something must want to eat them yeah and that was a that was a really great question a really fair question because you see a lot of things marketed like bringing in ladybugs and and I think that just finding that balance in our yards with more native plants and helping it find its own balance and putting out water and and such hopefully yeah it's usually one of those things I say if you build it it will come and it's it's true like the more the more native plants that I brought into my yard the more diversity I see in my yard and the more natural um pest control and I'm not see I'm not seeing anything that gets out of control in my yard anymore like I used to have a real aphid problem <laughs> back to the aphids right. and yeah I have aphids in my yard yes the ants mine them or farm them I do have them but I don't see them they're not destroying anything nothing is getting destroyed in my yard as a result of something that I would have seen before when I had more cultivated plants so I think by increasing the biodiversity in your yard through the use of native plants in particular because that's what a lot of insects have evolved to um to live with they need those those native plants um i find that having that increased biodiversity in my yard increases the balance and decreases the issues that i see in my yard for sure and then skunky comes through and takes care of the slugs so i'm happy and then you buy a macro lens and then buy you find out how super cool tiny things are it's true yeah. Yeah. And then and I have had want them. <laughs> and, then, yeah, and then you want them. Yeah. You see how cool, cool they are for sure. And I have had people who have asked, like, okay, so you're talking about biodiversity. So why does biodiversity matter? Mm. And from like a big, big picture, I, I do feel it's important to kind of point out that, okay, great. You know, maybe I don't really care about having birds in my yard or anything. So I'm just gonna rake up all the leaves, yada yada yada, clean up my yard, clean slate, start over. It's been fine for me so far. And that's okay if that's if that's your line of thinking. Um, but for me, biodiversity is really important, particularly as we are seeing a lot of um, climate change and a lot of other um, habitat loss and a lot of negative consequences of pesticides and chemicals unintentional or intentional. As we're seeing all of this, um, we're reducing our biodiversity and we're making ourselves more vulnerable. So the more biodiversity we have, the more resilient we are to these changes and the greater chance that we have to withstand changes over time. So if we have more biodiversity in our city, if we have more habitat available, this city becomes more resilient to climate change, becomes more resilient to um, all of the flooding and the droughts. Like there's natural checks and balances in place if we have them available. So having biodiversity just helps us withstand, in my opinion, um, helps us withstand all the changes that we're seeing coming down the pipe. So for me, it's something that's that's really important. That is such a, a great point to wrap up on. Thank you for sharing that and reminding us uh, of us the, the big picture. And yeah, and I guess our yards might be the only little habitat that some migrating species is finally, oh, finally I found one aster. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you think about, if you think about the scale of your yard, it may be small, but look at the insect, like the insect isn't big. It doesn't necessarily need um, a lot of space. And by providing that space for that species, like you said, now a migratory species comes in, a migratory bird comes in that you've never seen before. And it's there because you have what it needs in your yard and you're creating that space to, to open up. And also not only that, but making us more resilient to things like disease ourselves. So when you have less species available, there's greater chance that a disease can, can take hold in an area. So as we're seeing with the, with the, um, with the pandemic now, 
I'm not going to say that, you know, biodiversity losses is, is behind that because that's a, that's a whole nother thing, but having yeah. um, a greater biodiversity is going to help us be more resilient and decrease the chances that, um, that we're going to get struck by things as well as these as wildlife. And now I've gone on off on a different tangent, so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> no, that, that is such a great point. Thank you. It sure as heck can't hurt. Can't. I see comments hurt. coming in here, thanking you for your expertise, Sarah. And I know that, that we all share that. Uh, thank you for sharing and for your knowledge. Very helpful. And I don't know about other people, but I'd love to have you back again and um, <laughs> one day. Oh, no, you froze. And I oh. think what might be Marissa now. I did freeze, didn't I? Oh, dear. <laughs> Am I back? You're back. <laughs> Maybe we could have like an open, I'm not sure what the other folks think, even an open Q&A, like just uh, coming up into getting ready for spring of, of people getting ready of what should I plan? How do I plan these things? And because uh, this is just all fantastic. And I and I think like taking this knowledge that you've shared and now we can apply it in our own yards, like as really is right now and tomorrow. So there is another Wildlife Wednesday next week. And so Sarah, you're welcome to come and hang out with us. Um, we have Matt Wallace, who is going to be coming. Many of you know Matt. Uh, he's going to come and talk to us about uh, community science and learning even more about, again, like what Sarah was saying, that you know, biodiversity right outside our door. So hopefully all of you will join. You've been a wonderful group with great questions. And so keep an eye out for another Eventbrite link. If you have any feedback, please let us know. Um, we're a grassroots project, but we, we do want to keep improving and such. And uh, so again, many thanks to Marissa and Anne for all your work in coordinating. And Sarah, it's such a pleasure. You did such a beautiful job with this presentation and taught us so, so much. Oh, I'm very glad if, if anybody learned anything, I'm even one little thing, I'm happy. <laughs> oh, that is terrific. And thank you everybody for, for joining. It's wonderful. Oh, thanks everyone. Yeah. And we're going to hang out for just a second here and, and wrap up. So if anybody does have last minute questions that you, you want to throw at Sarah, you are more than welcome. Oh, two pages of notes. <laughs> that is that is excellent. Well, Connie, feel free to email me if you have questions. I'm always happy to, to talk wildlife and plants with people. So as That's you great. may have noticed, I go off on tangents if I'm talking in person. So maybe email's better. <laughs> <laughs> and we will send out, uh, thanks to Marissa, and she'll send out that information to how to reach Sarah with your consult consulting and everything as well. That's awesome. And thanks, Jamie, for the dew worms. Thanks for, thanks for coming through on that one and the landscaping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Jamie, are you with the landscaping company? I'm not sure if people can unmute themselves. That would be one thing. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have a landscaping company here in Calgary called Garden Gnomes YYC. Um, oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So glad that you came. Yeah, thanks. So what we're doing is for, for fall cleanups, instead of taking our leaves uh, to the landfill for, like they have a big compost pile at the landfill, but rather than taking our leaves there, uh, we partnered with a hobby farm south of Calgary. So, um, so we're taking all our leaves there um, so that the bugs and the microbes can just, just live there and go into the soil and, and help the garden. So. I prefer doing that instead of taking it to the landfill. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Is Garden Gnomes YYC, right? Yeah. We just started awesome. this year. Yeah. Thank you. Because yeah, it sounded like I saw your advertisement and I remember asking um, a little bit of a pointed question to you guys about how you, yeah, if you do bird friendly gardening where you'll leave some leaves behind. So yep. like put little comments here once in a while just to start the conversation and you're all over it. Yeah, you you absolutely do, hey? Yeah, I'm a nature nerd, so. <laughs> Sounds like you're in the right business. <laughs> yeah. 
and you do so you do landscaping in Calgary and do you do residential places as well, Jamie, or just commercial? Uh, it's all residential for now. Yeah. Well, um, and Kathleen, I think that I met you uh, when you're downtown. I was working with another landscaping company and uh, I met you at one of the buildings while you were collecting uh, like window, window hit birds. Oh, is it one with particularly glassy area with a really nice garden there? Yes. I the name of, but <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and now you're doing your own. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's small world. Such a small world. Well, <laughs> congratulations on opening your business. I'm so glad. And we, mm -hmm. I'm sure Marissa wouldn't mind putting the name of your, your company on the, on the sheet. I just keep throwing things at you, Marissa. I know you can handle it. So that's great. Well, thanks, Jamie. It's so nice that you're here. And there's a, a few other names. Uh, so with Heather and Kathy, Connie, Sandra, I think it's, is it Di? And Tiza, TZ. If anybody else has questions, feel free. Because I know Sarah loves to stay up all night talking about gardening. So if you have any last minute ones, here's your chance. And then we'll make sure we send uh, her contact information. And uh, and then, yeah, you'll be able to, to contact her for, for questions. And if you need any con consulting services or anything too, I'm sure that she'll be able to help you. And I think too, even through... Uh, the nursery. Uh, I love wildflowers. Wild about flowers. <laughs> Wild about flowers. Why can I never? Wild about flowers. Yeah, and I think they're really great about answering questions as well. And I've got a packet of seeds. Then now is the time to plant them. I guess. Uh, you'll have a look at what's in there, and yeah, if you have anything that needs a stratification period, then yes, that's the. That's the <laughs> <laughs> I believe it does. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, if nobody else has any questions, we'll wrap it up and we'll, we'll thank you again, Sarah, for everything and, and Marissa and Anne. And hopefully we'll see all of you next Wednesday with uh, Matt, who's a wonderful presenter as well and, uh, and always very um, informative and very interactive with lots of, lots of cool stories and lots of interesting things to talk about. Right. Well, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Stay safe and remember every little thing that you do makes a difference. So thanks for doing what you're doing. Have a great yes, night, thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Yay. <laughs> Bravo. Well done. Really, Sarah, you're awesome. Well, thanks, you know, and, and you're just so matter of fact and conversational, but there's so much content. Like that's that's one of the yeah. things I really enjoy about how you present. Like you know, you're really sort of, yeah, you're just friendly, like you're having a conversation and, but it's just jam packed. I really like your presentation style. So much good information. Thanks, right. That was so cool. cool. Yeah. Sandra said there's a meteor shower on Thursday night. Yeah. Oh, cool. Would I, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Anne. ADHD. Oh, please regale me more, Anne. Meteor. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. How are they? Huh? No, I do want to watch a meteor shower now. Tomorrow night, I'm gonna to have to watch it. Yeah, would you need you to see that with your naked eye? I wonder if I'd have to leave the city to see know. it. I missed the northern lights. When was that last week or the week before? Yeah, that was so amazing. I could see it right off my deck. It was like <sighs> so amazing. I you awesome. know got some good photos wow. of it too. Anyway, yeah, it was, it did was you? Cool. Oh, nice. That is nice. I did not. I went out and I'm like, eh, I don't think I see them. And then I went back in. That was the extent. I didn't see them. But I do want to see the meteor shower. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. That would be wonderful. And don't forget, Sarah, you're meeting with the bird friendly team about Team Magpie. Uh, what was that? Team Chickadee? Day? What? What was that? I heard Team Chickadee. <laughs> team Magpie. And hey, I, like this the, for us. I like the case you make for the chickadee, though. Like that made me stop and think. Yeah, because well, I, your... I have been team magpie, but you make a good point about the chickadees. So what was now your... I'll have to think about it. I don't recall well, your argument for team chickadee. I mean, yes, they're cute. Yes, I love them. They're adorable, but. On a cold winter day, who do you want to hear outside? The happy sound of the chickadee or maybe the magpie? I don't know. Oh, 
See, burn, burn. Kathy and Sandra are going to be on my team magpie because I have some video from backyard cameras of <laughs> chatty magpies who walk along and talk to themselves like, bow, 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 bow. oh, I wonder what's over here. I hope you're going to vote for magpie. Magpies are really great. Yeah. And you know what? I think, I think you might, they might win you over. <laughs> no. But maybe it'll be a bat because you're in New Zealand. Uh, in New Zealand, they have their bird of the year competition that just opened uh, yesterday, day before. It's, I guess, a big thing in New Zealand because they try to bring attention to rare bird species so that they'll be protected. And it is, yeah, so there, I follow a group. Process. Yeah, I follow a group that actually is trying to save, oh, I can never remember the name of them. It's this huge parrot that doesn't fly, it can't oh, fly. It and they live on a specific island and, and it's fascinating what they've done to, to try to bring this species back. Because they were being wiped out by feral cats and rats and they basically eliminated the cats and the rats on the island with, they airlifted most of the birds to um, another place, eradicated the pests on the island, wait for, waited for that to clear up and then they brought them back. Anyway, I can't remember the name of the bird, but they're these flightless parrots and they're huge, okay. they're like almost a meter tall. Wow. I got to look it up. Anyway, sorry, a little bit of a digression there. No, that's <laughs> neat. But you know what the really funny thing is now, because that bird is probably up for bird of the year. There's a bad that is officially made it onto the ballot. Yeah. So there's a big, very funny it's quite entertaining because some people are very mad about it and other people are taking <laughs> in stride that there's a bat who's up for bird of the year. Two kakapo? Kakers. The kakapo, exactly. I just found it myself. And I sponsored a couple of the birds in the project. You know how you can, like they've got all these different characters, like they've got different names for the males and their personalities. And so you can sponsor um, the birds. So I sponsored a couple of the birds. I got a stuffed kakapo. <laughs> no way. I'm such, a nerd. I'm such a nerd. Before you go, send me your pileated woodpeckers, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And off on the trails. Of the, where do you live, Sandra? I'm curious about that. And Kathy, it's nice that you're here too. Where do you live, Sandra? That you're just, sounds like you're just going to step off and go into the trails to the full moon. I'm imagining you in quite an exotic place now. Are you in Calgary? Or are you actually in Coventry, like you're I used to show the park? Oh, I don't think I've been east of Sherwood Park. I've been to Sherwood Park. I don't think I've gone further east. I've been a little bit further, actually. Yeah, and it's quite, um, yeah, quite well treated, and yeah, it's very pretty. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you, and thank you for joining us, Sandra. So you said you were saying, yes, going to, yeah, and you as well, Kathy. I'm not sure where Kathy's at, but yeah, it's okay, man. We're we're all good. Yeah, I told people we could hang out, hang out and visit. Oh, okay. You didn't That's say I just blabbing didn't say anything embarrassing. <laughs> you didn't say anything inappropriate or embarrassing. Oh, okay, all good. Well, no, but I took up more airtime than I wanted to. Like other people oh, should have. Time. This is our this is our behind the seat the stage. Okay. You know, people have backstage pass. Everybody's cool. Out. I am too totally good but if we want to talk about bats and magpies and you and i could go on about bats Definitely. and magpies absolutely that is that, that's burned in my brain like that magpie had him on his back and the magpie was standing on him wasn't he oh because yes, he was. you guys saw yeah, yeah. sorry it was like i don't know it was it was a, a very upsetting <laughs> kind of uh, incident oh Actually, that happened here the other day. I heard magpie. Oh, no, I didn't hear the magpie. I heard a, a bird just freaking out. And so I went out and the magpie had the bird on its back. So I went over, you know, of course, in my socked feet to go and see what was going on. And it was a house sparrow. <laughs> so then I was like, oh, gosh, I'm that person that just interfered. It's a house sparrow. But it, it was, I can imagine if it was a bat. That would have been very upsetting to see. You know, nature is very harsh. It can be, yeah. And that, I mean, it's just how it is, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. has to eat. 
that magpie found a sandwich. Don't worry. I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't he's need probably, the bat. He probably wouldn't need an orange crown warbler over at the window yeah. that I met Jamie at. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's so funny that we met her at 8th Avenue because I remember that now. I remember that as well, actually. I, I was there for that. I remember. You were, right? Her. There was, there was a whole, why were we, with, oh, we, there was a whole group of us, like Mel was there, I was there, you were there. Was that the Are night we training? went out to look for bats? Oh. I don't know. Maybe. I'm just wondering. Was Susan there too? All together. And like, I don't think, and I think Susan was there. She's yeah. the bat lady, right? So Susan, we did kind of like a trial. Because I remember, I remember hearing that. Learning about, yeah, that's right she brought her gizmo downtown where you could listen like it listens because you can't hear them. Wow, that was it so listens cool. and tells you about all the bats so cool. yeah I those well oh, i want to go cool. yeah i think we tried it around the bow i don't remember if we found anything we uh i've i've got one to take to hawaii with me this year cool. a bat or the bow uh, one of those bats <laughs> yeah no not a bat one of those <laughs> Don't take species to Hawaii. They don't like that. No. One of those <laughs> little sonar picker uppers, whatever cool. it's called. Cool. I'm going to yeah. take it with me to Hawaii. See if I, because there are bats there, apparently. Uh, there's, an, there's an endemic species of bat. And it's the only endemic species. What is, how do they say it now? I can't. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't exist yeah. anyplace else in the world. That's cool. I don't know if they're on Maui, yeah. though. Well, I'm going to go because I have to go put children to bed. There. Yes. Oh, well, right. Oh, so right. Much, Sarah. They've been you quiet such this a whole great time. Job. <laughs> oh, thanks, Anne. You do. You do such a great job. Thank you so much. Yes, thank yeah. you. Everyone is better than last. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Marissa. What were you going to say? Well, I was just saying it was an amazing presentation. Oh, well, thanks, Marissa. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad. glad it worked out. All right. Right. And, plants all day. <laughs> and we're happy that you do because you like <laughs> okay, thanks, you did a great job coordinating i have thanks, like Sarah. such a stress reduction thanks Janelle. and sarah have a wonderful night you as well thank Good night, you all. bye bye bye, bye. Are we okay for for next week? I I know I was probably brushing. Yeah, well, the one thing that to, that we do need to decide on is um, a practice session with Matt. Yeah, with Matt, and I've asked him to indicate whether Monday or Tuesday would be better for him and what time. So I don't know if that works for you guys. Yeah. If you have a preference yourselves, I'm good with either. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know the, the detail that I need to get from him is what is the involvement with nature Calgary? Because remember he asked if that was okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got back to him and I said, yeah, you know, we don't have any problem with that. It's always great to have linkages with people. Right. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if that's still going forward, if he's still somehow including nature Calgary, because I think we should know that. <laughs> Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, I was curious about that too. Yeah, so let me. Um, I'll get back to him to ask him. I. It's just sort of occurred to me this afternoon. Oh shit! <laughs> There's this okay. part of it. I was like, oh my god, I totally forgot to ask him about it. So I'll get on that. And he's been good now that he's kind of committed. He is responding to my emails and stuff, so that's good. Oh, I'm glad. He's such a nice guy. He actually he, does he a is. lot for. Yeah. Um, Oh, I just thought of something. Sorry. Here's where my brain goes. He is a lot. Oh, we're still recording. Here, let me turn this off. Um, 